awesome to have you back as likely being our 12,722nd viewer in our 239th episode of Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. We're back with our transcontinental triumvirate from you to Soto Brown in uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. And you, Ron Lindgren, are a mid-century modern master back in your Long Beach, California. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello. Good to have you back. And go to the first slide and start on a very depressing note, unfortunately. Because me, Martin Despang, would you wish so, still back near Munich, Hawaii, makes it only less of a, a drive, of a day drive away from the Ukraine, where uh, it's getting worse and worse. Uh, right now, as you know from the news, uh, humanity is butchered in the little town of Butcha near Kiev. And in Kiev, uh, we have our weekly German lesson for you to solo. What does the news article at the very bottom right tell us what else is going on in Kiev? Well, it has the ThinkTech logo over it, but it says, let's see, it says something about the uh, apartments in Kiev have been cold since Monday. And exactly. uh, that, that, I didn't figure that out on my own, I have to admit. I was told I was I was given assistance on that. You're, Monday, you're, I can read. you're a good student. And you know, the the weather over you from our iPhone there in, in the center it tells us that uh, April or March, April is the roller coaster uh, with temperatures, you know, going up and down. And we had and they had snow back, uh, as that snow symbol says, over the weekend. Now we're a little up, but again, the nights are still close to the freezing point and even daytimes, upper 40s, lower 50s isn't really anywhere close to the comfort level, uh, the perfect comfort thermal level of the human body. So it's quite still some miserable conditions. So obviously, you know, the worst condition, people being slaughtered and butchered there, the second worst condition is the one still living being left without the necessary, existentially necessary enclosure of what we call the third skin being uh, thermal epilogues and facades that you see on the Star Advertiser news uh, picture there with the facade being blown away and only parts of the furniture still in there. So most ironic where we would need that fenestration so badly, we decreasingly have it and where we really don't need it, because we have that thermal comfort, perfect 70s, almost year round, which is back with us in Honolulu, Hawaii, we increasingly have these in a way that we pass it on to you, Ron, uh, put some more illustrations, pictures to your analysis from the past that is way worth reiterating. So please take it from there, Ron. Yeah, last week, uh, we had all described some uh, uh, elements at the Kapi Olani residence, uh, high-rise condominiums, that at least in my opinion are sort of contrary to the notion of luxurious condo living. If we look at the upper left photograph, we're looking at an empty bedroom, uh, and you'll see just outside the glazing, the end wall glazing, a sort of a little blue box sticking out. That's uh, actually a balcony. Now for most units, that balcony happens to be yours. In other words, uh, this shot is taken from inside your bedroom. Next door is a, uh, a, a balcony that pokes out and does in, uh, inflict the, pot, the problem of privacy because uh, you know someone you might've invited over as a guest who's in your living room might be out. All he has to do is turn his head around when he's standing on that uh, balcony and look into your bedroom. But even worse, there are two units on each floor of the Kapiolani residence where that person who is looking into your bedroom is a next door neighbor. And this seems like an egregious planning mistake. If we go to this, uh, the, the center left photograph, here, we, we had talked about the fact that this building was glazed in a very highly tinted blue uh, material. 
And uh, this photograph shows that by, look, by having to look through that blue glazing, especially when, first of all, you look through the end wall, and then you look through the similarly blue tinted glazed glass railing, look how the view on the lower right portion of the end wall becomes a sickly blue pallor. The absolute glory of, Hawaii, of Hawaiian tropics is completely lost. The, the person in, in their million dollar two bedroom unit are looking out on a view that is saturated and ruined in a sort of blue miasma. And if we look at the lower uh, right photograph, the, what, what I'm showing here is here's, here is a balcony uh, and there's a strange black lump outside on the, uh, on the balcony. The balcony is already very small. It's less than 70 square feet. What is that lump? Well, the balcony is being used as, as a place to store outdoor mechanical equipment. It is a compressor condenser unit from something called a uh, mini, mini split ductless air conditioning system. And it's connected to what you see in the upper right of, the, of this picture, which is the second component of these systems. And that happens to be a visible and rather nasty looking air handling unit, an evaporative air handling unit. The, the element outside, which is blocking the view and making the, the, uh, the lanai nearly uninhabitable, is connected to that uh, air handling unit through a conduit that connects them together. And that particular piece of equipment out there is also intentionally pouring condensate water onto the lanai deck because it has, to, it has to get rid of condensate water that's created in the air handling unit that is pumped back to the compressor condenser and then literally dumped outside. Well, and how that then appears from the outside gets us to the next slide. Because uh, we are on the Kapilani residences or the Azure or what? Maybe. I think this is the central. This is the central. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to tell. So, it's hard to tell. So like, you're all just big blue concrete boxes. Yeah. But this so is this... another one in the same vicinity. <laughs> Yeah, this was supposed to be a joke, but a bad one. And then no, now the time. One. Well, yeah, well. And so let's be try to be fair. Um, Ron, you once rightly so said, I'm I'm quoting you, at least these have, I don't know if we want to call them lanais, that is debatable. You already called them balconies, which is probably more what they deserve to be called. But anyways, there is some outdoor spaces there. And in this one here, uh, in its favor, one can say there is actually a variety because there are some that we learned uh, how they're called when we're looking at the Kuula Tower because they're all tucked in, pushed back, open just to one side. And these are called loggias. And there is a subversion of that loggia because the row of three on the right side, the one on the, on the end is open to one other side. And then there is the one that you pointed out, Ron, that's the all cantilevering out. So at least there is a variety. But then again, as you reminded us, Ron, let's not judge a book just by the cover, even though the cover is pretty uh, clear and transparent, literally and, literally and figuratively speaking. Let's go to the next slide and uh, analyze the building more in its anatomy and let's look at the floor plan and it is a double loaded corridor once again the glorious times of the from a developer uh you know today considered to be an inefficient uh single lo loaded corridor that would uh, allow easy breeziness are long gone they all do the all american hermetic 20th century double loaded corridor. but at least one little thing they do again like the recent one they uh, create some uh, light at the middle of this tunnel that pours in from the uh, open end of the uh, what's in between the elevators. And that one uh, might actually be a tribute to what you see at the top right, which is our favorite building in the area, which is our Alamana building, because that does the same thing. 
But that seems really about the only thing at all that it borrows from because everything else it does differently. And we're about to say wrongly, starting with orientation, the Alamoana building runs Malka Mackay that makes this long facade facing east and west that these sun retractable louvers then perfectly shade while still allowing daylight in. This building is facing, is turned 90 degrees uh, to it, uh, uh, the opposite, and is that way facing directly uh, with his long side Malka and Mackay. The north facade then is, is then worry free, but the south facade is the worst trouble uh, you can get yourself into. And let's look at that trouble and go to the next slide. And it also contains an extract from the previous plan that you are most uh, curious investigator, private investigator Ron spotted that how honest the developer was and proved that through drawing. Point this out to us. That's what we see at the very top row. Yeah, I might say first that to, uh, to introduce uh, the central Ala Moana, this is a 43-story tower with 512 units, which means well over probably 1,200 people live in this. Up the upper right, you can see that uh, a section, just a slight uh, strip from the floor plan has been, has been highlighted. The developer, to his credit, when they illustrated these rel relatively small uh, balconies to prospective buyers, did show a little rectangle, which takes up about a third of the space of the 72 to 76 square foot uh, balcony. And that, once the owner asks, well, what is that, would realize that that is that piece of outdoor mechanical air conditioning equipment that is required to be there on each and every balcony of this entire tower. Yeah, and in, in between these, let's call them lanai's because they're a little deeper as you also found, found out, Ron, and they're also a little bit wider. So, and they're facing south. So they are actually doing a job just like your, your cap when you're looking south midday, the lid is covering your face and you know keeping it from getting burned. So that works. But then that means it doesn't work at all what's in between. And there is this blue glass again. And uh, the blue glass is, uh, is, is BB. And that is not as sexy as Brigitte Bardot, but it's baked bedrooms. Because you always have the bedrooms behind that flush glass with little to no, these little, you know, really, pretty silly awning little openings there, but pretty much nothing. So what choice do you have? You just got to pull that curtain close from the inside. That is not doing much because the sun's rays had already been converted into heat. So as you call it like a tragic or intentional planning mistake, Ron, right? There we go again. Why would one do that? Because in a bedroom, you want to stay cool and you can say, well, you're only going to be there at night, but over the day that has terribly heated up unless you are doing what you should decreasingly do because of all the geopolitical and bio, uh, you know, climatic problems of burning fossil fuel and cooling yourself. But you have no other choice because otherwise these bedrooms are unbearable. So let's go to the next slide and see how the, uh, and t how the uh, uh, developer sells this with a suggestive illustrations rendered at the very bottom left. And let's analyze that and let's compare it with other experiences. And again, turning it over to you, Ron, because we're comparing it to your immediate surroundings of your house that we have been dedicated numerous shows to and compare this to this situation, please. Well, the unit in, in central Alamoana is a corner unit, and it's going to be baking again through those uh, windows, which in this case, uh, I, I'm looking at, trying to look at it closely. I don't even think I see uh, curtains there, or are they? Maybe you, maybe there, are, you can... there are some. There are some, yeah. Oh, that's good, because my, my vision is a little bit... Uh, uh, 
not as great as it used to be. But uh, to the left of that is my lucky situation where a portion of my living room is all facing north, which means I, I, there were drapes there originally. I was able to just tear them down. And my home isn't air conditioned at all. And in fact, in weather like today, where it's going to be 89 and tomorrow 96 degrees in Los Angeles, the reason that I can live with this glorious two stories of glass is that the center two strips of glass from floor to ceiling are made up of clear, adjustable louver. And all I have to do is crack the louvers up near the ceiling, uh, the heat rises, and it is completely sucked out of the house and in an, on a 96 degree day, I'm very comfortable inside. Yeah, and we're, we're featuring Le Corbusier at the very top left with a show quote for a couple of reasons. And we want to remind the audience of Le Corbusier's sort of almost schizophrenic parallel applied research of two different sort of philosophies. One was the Domino House, and the Domino House is uh, mostly known, and the most sort of famous uh, built representation of that is the Villa Savoie, as the sort of floating on pilotes under the blue Mediterranean sky, hovering house, all out and about. But at the same time, he was recognizing the human need and desire for retracting, for being cozy and being tucked away and he called that the mono system and he built some mono houses near Paris in the outskirts some vacation homes they're way more earth burned cozy um, you know have grass roofs and are way more uh, introverted one could say versus the extroverted your house uh, Ron and this is the show quote at the very bottom right recognizes both. This is kind of your man cave living room uh, that gives you that sort of, you know, provides for that your mood when, you know, you don't want to be out and about and just want to be there by yourself and read books and watch movies and whatnot uh, versus when you want to be out on your lanai or just in your kobu uh, chairs, uh, just, just behind it, talking to Corbusier, right? And talking furniture, we see a similarity, and I throw this out that I think is the only similarity between your very tropical exotic living and their very um, inclusive, because your house is also you know, a, a mid-range uh, priced house. So it's very inclusive, and it is easy breezy and bioclimatic versus this one here is exclusive because of the price and very hermetic, uh, very invasive. And the only thing they share is that wonderful Archilla Castillo Gloni uh, Arco floor lamp from 1962 that I just have the feeling they threw in there into the rendering to distract from their criminal actions of, you know, again, um, uh, a, a, a design mistake of creating a unit that is facing southwest, which is the worst, which has no recognition and doesn't get anywhere to the point of that's the other part of the late Le Corbusier, that's what the show quote at the very top left refers to, was getting more into keeping yourself cool through Brie Soleil's. They don't go through this effort at all, but there would have been sort of a compromised version, and that gets us to the show quote at the top right, which we've been pointing out a couple of times, with a little bit of German patriotism on my side, because the all traditional German glass manufacturer with the name a rooster glass, Glassball Hahn, with that red logo, they have not given up in increasingly more than ever us being worried about how we're going to stay warm during the next winter when we're not getting Putin's gas anymore, which we shouldn't. We're scratching our heads. So in this, you know, we've been getting rid of all the inefficiencies in the building envelopes, which in a temperate climate, the single layer glass jealousies that work for you in your Long Beach run and for me in Honolulu, Hawaii, and for you to so to work there, don't work there. But they did not give up on that and developed it into a triple pane, passive house certified glass jealousy that one could have installed. And then in the peaks of the high summer where you think you really need to have the AC, you run it, 
But then in the many months where the outside temperature is exactly the indoor, which equals the perfect thermal comfort temperature of in the mid 70s, you could open them. So there would have been various ways of solving this, even within their paradigm of a glass box, but they took no efforts, unfortunately, and, and, and shamefully, which gets us to the next slide, uh, which is dedicated to BB again, baked bedrooms, because we're walking around the buildings. We're at the east elevation. That's where the sun rises, is very low, is very hot in Honolulu, Hawaii, and you're going to be woken up by the sun hitting your face, making you hot, unless you burn that bloody oil, which we shouldn't do anymore. So then let's look at the other side where the sun sets. Next slide. Uh, this is the Western elevation. And ironically, usually you say, you know, the higher you go up in a condo, the better it is, the better is the view. It's all about the view. And, you know, the more costly is it. If you are having a bioclimatic mindset, not in that one, I would stay down there where the neighboring building is basically casting a shadow and you would stay cool. So is there anything getting close to tropical exotic in the building at all? And that like gets us to the next slide. And you guys tell me. <laughs> well, the only thing that really does perform and happens to look nice as well is this metal screening. However, the metal screening in this case is not doing anything very significant because this is just a passageway between the building and the parking structure. So you don't really need any comforting shade in there. You're not going to be hanging around there. You're just going to be walking through. So what they're doing is using something that's actually performing a function which is to create shade, as well as allowing sight to go in and out so that you're not closed into a solid structure, but it's in a place where it's not doing any good. Now, just around the, in that same neighborhood, however, we can find other performative structures like that that are metal screens. And in the top right corner, you can see the facade of the Sunset Tower building, which is built about 1970. And that's facing onto Atkinson Drive on the uh, Diamond Head end of Ala Moana Center. And then also we see other buildings in Honolulu that use that similar type of metal screening. And again, it allows vision in and out but it also blocks a lot of the sun's rays. So you're not getting the full blast of that energy that you don't necessarily want. And these are pictures of the King Center on King Street. Again, that's not too far away. So back 60 years ago, people were using the same technique, but they were using it in a way that made sense and was actually useful in addition to being a decorative statement for the time. What we're seeing now is, again, modern versions of this, like we just saw with the central, but they're not being used for performative reasons. They're just there as decoration. Yeah, so let's say goodbye to this, another hermetic blue glazed one with the next slide. Um, and, you know, in sort of fairness, I guess, uh, uh, checking out with its northern elevation, which is the least problematic, because again, this is where the sun hardly ever is. So bioclimatically, this is okay. But again, um, you guys were supposed to ask me if this is maybe in Munich, play, <laughs> continue to play games, because we have one standing wave, the Eisbach, which our exotic escapism expert Susanna introduced to us. So the guy with his car with a surfboard on top could drive to that one because this building would actually perform fairly well here in Munich. It actually would perform better if that would be a southern fenestration. Never mind the summer that we also have where it's hot, so you would have to, you know, cover you know, the blue glass as well for the summer condition. But in the winter condition, that would be very welcome to make up for Putin's gas that we can't have anymore, as we know, because it would create passive solar gain. But that we don't need in a while, never, ever, or hardly ever, except somewhere high up in the mountains, you know, relatively, you know, maybe you can discuss it. But otherwise, 
nowhere would you would you want that would you have that so again we're on the ongoing relentless search of something tropical exotic please guys do that and let's get our hopes back up high with the next slide which is it looks like right this is actually across the street right across the street a construction fence and the developer gives us hope right because they're images of tropical exotic palm trees beach el Moana beach park most likely because that's adjacent surfboard guy and that woman here that happened to walk by just appropriately dressed right not overdressed not sweating she's just wearing as much as it takes to feel comfortable. Back there, we see uh, a mother with some children as another image on the construction site. We actually see Alamona Beach Park. So boys, this must be finally back to a uh, tropical exotic tradition, which next slide is actually the legacy of this site, DeSoto, right? Yeah, this is the, the former Ken Rock building. This was a low-rise, two-story uh, complex of three buildings with parking underneath and around it, uh, built from 19, the late 1940s to the early 1960s. It was something that we really admired. It was very livable. It was attractive. It had this mid-century appearance, and it didn't use an excessive amount of energy, and it was very walkable. And uh, it was designed by Frank Haynes, and you can see Frank in the upper left corner, he did a tour, a walking tour of it for the Dokomomo organization. I did not get to go on that. I still regret that to this day. But unfortunately, the Kenrock building and the Kenrock complex is no longer with us because that's the site of the building that we are about to talk about, the one with the wonderful pictures on its construction fence. And do those pictures actually tell us about the real conditions of the building. Let's go to the next slide. Well, I would say we have to leave that for next week if you're okay. already at the end at the end of the show. But let's make you hungry for that one by saying the Soto, as much as we, the three of us, love the really best practices from the past. You just sort of particular are open as sort of a child, literally and figuratively speaking, of the heydays of modernism in a way and having grown up in that fantastic area that I'm very jealous of, as you're jealous that I was at that walking tour and was able to uh, listen to Frank uh, in his fascinating way explaining his buildings from the past. I'm jealous of you having grown up when the Alamoana building was around and you and cool literally and figuratively speaking. So that being said, uh, we uh, basically put our Dokomomo head aside when it comes to the evolution of the tradition of innovation as one of my favorite shows of yours that is called like that, that we're saying if something really good has to be taken down, then it needs to be replaced with something even better, which is tough because the previous one was already really, really good. So if they were able to do that here, we will have to save for next time actually not next week because we're going to take a little break from this our sequence for you to soto to look back into what was before the pandemic and then the pandemic and then after the pandemic and after that the week after most likely we will return uh, with this one here and tell you uh, how the uh, sky alamana which is the name of that new building that's replacing the uh Ken Rock building so uh, for then and until then, please stay tropically exotic, exotically tropic. Bye bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo.
You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.